afternoon or evening to those of you that are joining us today. My name is Kevin Mulhall. I'm the Senior Technical Customer Success Manager here at TechSoup. And this month's virtual office hour, I'm very excited. We are going to be discussing data loss prevention and compliance in Microsoft 365, safeguarding your tenant account. We're definitely in for a special treat today. Uh, we are bringing in uh, the big guns, if you will. Uh, Mike Miller is joining us um, from Cloudly Sec. Uh, Mike's background, and we'll get to it in a, sec in a second, is, uh, is specifically around DLP and compliance. And uh, we're going to get a live demo too, so you get to see uh, this happen in real time. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, if you are not comfortable being a part of the session while it's being recorded, you're certainly welcome to leave. We will be following up uh, next week with a email that will contain information that provides a link to the recording as well as the decks that are going to be presented here. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, uh, to use the chat function, uh, please use the chat function to place any questions and or comments that you may have uh, during the presentation uh, into there. Uh, microphones have been enabled, but we ask that you have them off during the presentation for the sake of the recording uh, and for our panelists. Uh, closed For closed captions, please click on the ellipsis. If you are using the browser-based version, the tile will appear when you take your cursor over towards the center, bottom center of the screen. Click on the three dots, turn on live captioning. The desktop application, it's in the more area in the upper right near React and camera. So our guest panelist today uh, is Mike Miller. Um, I actually am going to go ahead and we're going to hand this off to him to let him uh, kind of give his background. I, I, I feel like I, I don't want to do him any injustice. So go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Kevin, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so welcome, everyone. Happy to be here. As Kevin mentioned, I'm Mike Miller. Um, I've been doing IT related things since 2014. It started with a little over four years in the Marine Corps where I was a database administrator. Um, <clears throat> after getting out in 2018, I jumped straight into consulting uh, with a local consulting company here in Indianapolis, which is where I, I still am based out of. Um, was kind of lucky to be exposed to Microsoft environments right off the bat. Um, really piqued my interest in terms of you know some of the capabilities that I was seeing there, as well as um, for whatever reason, my ability to pick it up quickly and to help our clients. Um, so after a short stand at a consulting company, I did move on to an internal position with the Indiana Pacers in Indianapolis, um, where I was their Microsoft Service Administrator for or Service Engineer uh, for a little over two and a half years, uh, and it was a full E5 Microsoft 365 E5 um, engagement, if you will. We, we they had just upgraded to the E5 license, and they needed someone to come in and make use of all the, the technology that was available to them at that point in time. So, um, you know, for the better part of two and a half years, I was implementing these tools as an internal employee, uh, getting used to them, working out all of the issues and, and getting experience working with like the key stakeholders across the business units and stuff like that. Um, and after that, I've, I've been doing consulting um, since then, started going back into consulting back in 2021. Uh, I've worked with SMBs, I've worked with enterprise clients, I've worked with manufacturing and legal companies, I've worked with finances, uh, banks. I'm currently the Microsoft Purview Administrator for Navy Federal Credit Union, uh, actually. And I'm also starting, to Kevin's point, starting my own consulting company called Cloudy Security, um, just looking to help the SMB market improve their overall security and compliance with Microsoft and the tools that are likely available to you, but you just have to have a dedicated person to do the implementing. So um, to Kevin's point, my contact information is here. You'll have this presentation after the fact. Um, you'll also be able to see my bookings link in the meeting chat. If you want to get on there and take a look at my calendar, which is always up to date, uh, and you want to schedule some time, and, and those are always free, uh, I'm more than happy to do it just to continue this conversation, or if you have more specific conversations or uh, whatever it is you want to talk about, feel free to use that bookings link and, and throw some time on there and um, 
I look forward to having a conversation with any one of you. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and get into the part that you guys really care about, which is the presentation. Um, I will say I am going to do my best to avoid um, the old fashioned death by PowerPoint. Um, there's a lot of words and a lot of slides on this presentation, but I want to make sure that I go through quickly and get to the live demo, which is usually what people want to see. Um, but at any point, if there are any questions, please, please put them in the chat. Um, Kevin, I, I trust that you'll let me know if I happen to miss those. And if I'm looking over here, it's because I'm trying to catch the chat. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and start taking a look at, you know, trying to understand what Microsoft Purview Information Protection Suite is. Um, it is a suite of tools, uh, but the biggest thing that I want to focus on is right here in the middle. It's circled is sensitive information types and sensitivity labels. These two things, sensitive information types is the true uh, data identifier that Microsoft leverages. There's over 300 and there's over 300. I think it's like 306 out of the box sensitive information types configured from Microsoft. And these are looking for, you know, the PCI, the PII, but they're also looking for passwords and credentials and security keys from like Azure Key Vault or um, different types of credentials, different types of medical information. Um, those sensitive information types are looking for all of that data and it's so many countries. I can't even list all of the countries that are already pre-built, but you can also build your own if you want to use regex or keyword list dictionaries. Um, document fingerprints, right? We've all gone to the dentist office and they say, hey, fill out this paperwork for me. It's the same paperwork for everyone, but you enter your specific specific information. Well, we could take that that blank form that has all the same fields and upload that into Microsoft Purview and say, this is a sensitive file. This is a fingerprint of a file we want to protect anytime is it identified in the environment. And no matter what you put on it, the form will be the same in terms of what fields need to be filled out. And we can identify and protect that file once it's uploaded to the cloud or, or on premise. Um, as you can see, these sensitive info types and sensitivity labels then extend out into the different tools available within Purview. Uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps can protect your SaaS applications, your SaaS platforms like Salesforce, ServiceNow, Dropbox, Box. Uh, you have on premise capabilities if you're still running on premise SharePoint or on premise file shares. Of course, you have your Office 365 capabilities as well as your endpoint DLP. Um, so with that, there are some advanced compliance solutions like e-discovery, insider risk management, communication compliance, which is something like, you know, inside of Teams, you don't want people sending vulgar abuse words or, or anything like that. You can prevent that communication through Teams. Um, but, you know, to focus on today's talk, we're going to be looking at sensitivity labels and data loss prevention. Um, and the reason we're having that conversation specifically is the overall data protection and governance approach that Microsoft tries to take that they recommend companies try to take is four phases, starting with knowing your data. And the, the point there is you can't possibly know what to protect if you don't know what data you have. You can't possibly know what policies to put in play if you don't know how your organization needs to be able to move these files, this information, right? So you have to know your data before you start any of this. And there are many different ways to do that. There's the old fashioned talking with the key stakeholders. There's tools within Microsoft like Content Explorer that can tell you exactly how many files or what files contain a social security number uh, or what types of data you have out there in the environment. But then you have protect and prevent data loss. You have protecting your data, which is it's, it's your sensitivity labels. Sensitivity labels, and I'll get into what those are, can help classify and encrypt your files and your emails when they contain sensitive information or if a user decides to put one on themselves. And then you prevent the loss of that data through data loss prevention. Um, and then you wrap it up with governing your data and getting rid of what you no longer need using the retention and deletion processes built into Microsoft uh, to get rid of the you know seven year old HR data that is no longer needed. Uh, for example, or if you wanna have a three year delete as per your company regulations, you can have that as well for some things. Um, so that's kind of the four phase approach that Microsoft takes, but right there in the middle is that protecting and preventing the loss of your data. Um, so that's what we're gonna take a look at today. All right, so taking a look at sensitivity labels and kind of what they are, again, not trying to do, not gonna read this word for word, but 
the important part is the sensitivity label is a tag that you apply to your files, that you apply to your emails, whether that's manual or systematically through content detection. Uh, and then that tag stays with that file through its entire life cycle, whether it leaves a company, whether it's shared, st stored internally, put on a USB drive, that tag goes until you remove it. Uh, so that is, is critical in terms of being able to follow that file. You know, if you think of an event of a compromise and you want to know if your data was exported, you're going to be able to follow all of your files that have labels on them through a tool called Activity Explorer, for example. And you'd be able to, uh, you know, take actions on getting that data back, revoking access, um, things of that nature. It, it's critical to getting these tags on there and getting your data classification on your files, uh, which is what you can use for sensitivity labels such as, you know, public or general data, confidential, highly confidential, uh, whatever the names that make sense for your organization. Um, you can make those your label names and then deploy them through there. Uh, on top of that, you can also apply them to containers. So Microsoft 365 groups or SharePoint sites, team sites. And those are more for controlling the sharing from those sites, the conditional access settings, and we'll get into those here in a minute. Um, <clears throat> like I said, you do have your three ways of applying. You have your, your manual in terms of how you apply files to or labels to files and emails. You have your manual method, which is just selecting it inside of the application. You have your recommended which is content detection based. This is something you configure within the label itself. You say if it has one to 10 social security numbers, recommend the confidential label gets applied to the document. The user has the option to approve or deny that recommendation. Um, and if you're tired of them denying your recommendations, you can turn on automatic labeling. If there's one to 10 social security numbers, apply the confidential label. Don't recommend it, just put it on there. Um, now, of course, the user could remove that label or downgrade it, but that's logged, and we're going to see why they decided to do that. Um, I do want to call out licensing requirements. Uh, manual and then automatic and recommended do have different licensing requirements. Manual is really that E3 business premium feature set, whereas automatic and recommended, you're going to need to get into kind of the E5 compliance add-ons or the Microsoft 365 E5 license itself. Um, so that is the more expensive option, but there's a lot of great capabilities there with recommended and automatic. So. All right, so. There are different areas where labels can be applied and there are different things that labels can do. Um, one of the most common things that people consider is the encryption, but again, there's access control and file marking built into that as well. You can determine what users and groups have which level of access. So you can get very, very granular with the controls on this data. If it is a HR file that only HR needs access to and you want to build a label specifically for that, you can do that. You can say, here's my HR sensitivity label. With that sensitivity label, you can put in the HR distribution group and then only HR is going to get access. And you can even say, you know, HR is going to get read only and then this one specific person in HR gets added access. It can get extremely granular. Um, that's a little harder to manage, um, but you can get very granular with the permissions. Um, you can let users specify the permissions themselves, uh, and I'll show you that here in a little bit. That's known as user defined, um, but like I said, you can pick from a different a list of different permissions. There's pre-built ones like co-owner, co-author, reviewer, viewer, uh, but then there's custom, and you can make any combination of those pre-built ones yourself. Um, and then you can also force access uh, to expire, block offline access, and you can do file markings with headers, footers, or watermarks. The watermarks is a files only feature. Um, one thing I wanted to go over as well is the Microsoft Teams meetings. So this is a new feature, but it's also a Teams premium feature. So it is a license upgrade for Microsoft Teams if you want to have this capability, but you can now apply classifications and restrictions to your Teams meetings. Um, some of the more commonly asked ones are in terms of like controlling who can record the meeting, uh, enable auto recording, or if you want to use something like end-to-end -end encryption for the video and the audio of that meeting, uh, you can also apply watermarking to the file or to the you know the video content um, as well. Or you can just turn off like meeting chats. Right, those are some of the options you get with this. But again, you're going to have this, so I'm not going to sit here and read you every single one of these words here. Um, nobody's here for that. So. 
The other option with sensitivity labels, again, I talked about the containers, right? The M365 groups or SharePoint sites. So the groups gives you the capability of saying, you know, with this sensitivity label applied to an M365 group, it's a public group or it's a private, meaning only team owners and members can access it and only owners can add people. But if it's public, anyone can access the group and anyone can add members to the group. Uh, but you can disable the ability for owners to add external members. So yeah, sure, anyone can access it, but no one is adding external people to the to the group, which is important. Um, and maybe there's a use case where you need external people in the group, but if you're labeling it, then you probably don't want external people there. Um, from a site perspective, that's where you get in terms of, you know, control external sharing. So if anyone has used SharePoint before, you know that you can share a file out of there and you get a list of options, right? It can be anyone, it can be new and existing guests, specific people, only internal that already have access to the file. Well, you can set that for the entire site itself by applying a sensitivity label, and then you can you set the setting of what the sharing permission is whenever you configure the label itself. Um, so if you apply that label to the SharePoint site, it's going to overrule anything that the admin of that SharePoint site had set. The, 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 file, the label will overrule that. Um, you can also configure conditional access controls on the site. So if you wanted to disable the ability on a sensitive site, say finance, who controls all of the company's credit card numbers and any client payment processes, um, their site, you want to block unmanaged devices from accessing the files unless they go through the browser. Uh, you can do that with the conditional access controls available to you through a sensitivity label, uh, or you can require something called an authentication context, where you can say, hey, look, if you're accessing this site, I need you to agree to an acceptable terms of use policy, and I need you to re-MFA to prove you, know, you are who you say you are, and we don't have a malicious user among us. The next few slides are going to kind of cover your sensitivity label options from like a diagram perspective. Not going to spend a lot of times on these. I, I want you all to have these after the fact. Um, so you all can refer to these, use them however you want. Again, you're going to have full access to this presentation. So please use this if you so want to. If you want to review this content, these diagrams are for you all to reference after the fact. Not going to not going to go through each one of these bubbles here. So. Um, before we get into the rest of the diagrams, though, I do want to cover the client side versus service side labeling. Um, this is important to understand. So we've talked about selecting labels within your office applications. That's considered client side labeling. That is in the moment from the end user's perspective, applying the label. And again, that's where you get the three ways. You get the manual, the recommended or the automatic applications. Those are deployed through what are called label policies within the purview portal. Um, and those policies are nice because you can say things like which users get which sensitivity labels. So again, go back to that HR example where you're getting very granular. If you want to label just deployed to HR that only HR gets access to if it's applied, you can do that by setting in the policy settings saying this is only for the HR business unit. Nobody else is going to see this label. Um, so that's a, a good way of keeping different labels for different scenarios separate. Um, of course, there's typically an overarching default policy where you want everyone to have your four standard tiers of classification or however many standard tiers you have. Uh, you have your default policy, but you can get granular from there and give people specific labels after the fact. Um, you can require something like a justification for removing or downgrading the classification of a label, uh, and I'll show you that here in just a few minutes. Um, and then you can require a label on all files and emails. The caveat with that is it can be a little disruptive. Um, if you don't set a default label, for example, but you do require a label, at the beginning of your label journey, you're going to realize your users are not used to setting a label on a file. It's not a standard process that they have done for the last 20 years. Their entire professional career, they haven't been selecting sensitivity labels, so they're not going to be used to doing it um on a routine basis right so if you set require a label and i go to hit send on an email and i didn't select that it's going to stop me in my tracks and make me pick a specific label of my choosing to then send the email it, it can be disruptive same thing with saving a file right especially if you have auto save on until they apply that label they're not going to be able to save the document um you can do something like a custom help page um this is really I've done a, a couple of these for organizations where we build in a site that is just that just contains 
quick reference cards, quick fixes, maybe an overview of what each label is for, why you would use it, the different scenarios, and the impact of applying that label. Um, if a user needs to refresh their, their memory outside of the initial training that they probably received. Um, but like I said, you can also do a default label. Um, emails do have the ability to automatically inherit the label from a, an attached file. If that file has, say, a, a higher sensitivity label applied to it, it could then apply that same label to the email itself. Um, so that's client side. And then you have service side labeling, which is all about data and rest, right? So you have your you have your 2 million files that are stored between your SharePoint and your OneDrive locations because you've been around for 30 years or, or however long. Well, now you want to start encrypting that data at rest because nobody's accessing every single one of those files, right? So this will actually go out and scan your files for specific content, right? We talked about those sensitive information types. This could be looking for credit card numbers or social security numbers or a combination of multiple different data types and applying a label of your choosing based on things like the number of instances found within a file or the combination of instances, right? Any or all are some of the uh, factors that you can put into place. Say, I'm looking for credit cards and social security numbers, or I'm looking for credit cards or social security numbers um, within the statement, and then it'll apply the label when it's matched. Uh, you can run these in simulation mode, which is a great feature. It can help you identify what the impact would be uh, on the company from there. That way you can have time to not only properly identify false classifications, right? To retrain the system and say, that's not actually a credit card number, it's a serial number, right? You can retrain it that way, but you can also take that information to train your end users, right? And, and help them maybe get a better understanding of why they have that sensitive data or help you understand why they have it and then how they leverage it. Now you can control what settings get put on the file from there. Um, but, and then you can scan for pre-built templates, you know, something like the US Patriot Act, for example, is built in and it contains all of the sensitive data types that are covered by the US Patriot Act. Um, or you can use custom templates, you know, such as PCI, and I have a really bad typo there. Sorry about that. I'll fix that. Um, but you can use something like PCI or PII data and select those yourself. And I've been talking for a long time, so if there's Q and A's, please, please ask your questions throughout the presentation and, and I'll uh, make sure we get them answered. Uh, there's a lot to cover, so I don't want anybody to forget by the end, the end of the call, so. All right, so here's some more of the diagrams. So um, this shows you the three options and kind of the decision tree that each one's gonna go through. Um, this one has a lot to it. So at a high level, right, you have the manual labeling on the left. Um, yes, thank you, Kevin. I'm sorry. I speak in acronyms a lot. I am trying to get better about that. PII is personally identifiable information. Um, so sorry if I uh, lost anyone on that. The You have the manual labeling on the left where it's going to ask, the system is going to ask itself, the first thing is, is a label required? Um, and one thing you'll see on here is there's a couple of bubbles here for E3 and E5. So label required and manual labeling is an E3 feature, right? Um, but recommended or automatic labeling, now you're getting into E5. So it is important to know that difference, especially for whatever has been enabled in your environment from a license perspective. Um, but it's always going to ask itself, is the label required or is there a policy being triggered by the contents of this data? And then from there, it's a decision tree. If there's not a label required and the user doesn't apply the label themselves, well, now we'll take a look at the next slide and say now there's some more decisions to be made from the manual perspective. But if there is a label required or the user does apply the label, now you've got the label applied. You can follow that document wherever it goes. The same concept comes into play from a recommended policy, except there's an added step of, well, did the user accept my recommendation or did it reject it? If it rejected it, now you've got an unlabeled document. So if it did accept it, well, you've got a labeled document. Um, and then same thing with automatic, except there's no recommendation. You just get that label if there is a policy. And then this is the manual labeling with a little bit more detail, a couple steps added into it. So again, they don't label it. Now you have to rely on other areas of protections, other conditions, such as the sensitive information types within it, the process of sharing it, the file types in play, and you can use other tools based on those conditions like data loss prevention, um, which again, we'll talk about here soon. And again, Something like endpoint DLP is an E5 only feature. You don't get endpoint DLP with E3 licensing. So again, I want to make sure that those are called out um, for everyone's convenience. And, and this is something I've given to a lot of clients over consulting. And 
uh, I think they appreciate the the licensing information more than they appreciate the content itself. So um, licensing with Microsoft is always a cloudy area for everyone. So. Uh, and then there's the recommended just runs you through a little further again, not a lot of time to spend here. Uh, you got your automatic here at the end. It's a little bit more simple than the recommended process. Uh, there's one less step added in there. You either get the label or you don't. All right. From a recommendations perspective, the. There's a couple of things I want to point out here again, not going to read every single word on this page. Um, but avoid scoping. So I, we talked about how there are the ability, there's the ability to assign labels to files and emails and meetings. And then there's also the ability to assign, assign labels to containers. It's really important and, and it's highly recommended that you should keep labels separate between groups and sites and files and emails. Um, one way to do that is to do something like sub labels, right? Where you create a parent label and then underneath that is a sub label. One sub label is for files and emails, and that's what the user will see within their file. And then the other sub label can be assigned to the group or site, and that's it. Um, so it's try to keep those separate. They're going to have different meanings. They're going to have different names, and the impact is going to be very different, and you want the users to fundamentally understand the difference. Um, you also want to keep the number of labels deployed to your users small. Uh, I do prefer no more than five in a production environment, but you can use sub labels to kind of go along with that. Maybe you want to say all employees versus trusted people, right? Trusted people would have external access capabilities where all employees is internal only. Um, and those are some examples of sub labels. You could also do sub labels based on departments. Again, so we talked to HR. Marketing doesn't need to see HR, but at the same time, HR probably doesn't really need or care to see marketing. So you can have different sub labels based on your departments as well. Um, the transition to automatic labeling should be as needed for highly sensitive content. The reason I say as needed, uh, you're going through a crawl, walk, run approach to your labeling. You're going to start with manual. Uh, and, and I say that because really you should from a user adoption perspective, but also a user understanding. When users don't understand something, the, the fact of the matter is, is they're going to try to find ways to avoid it. They're going to try to find ways to avoid using a sensitivity label. If they find a way to avoid it, they're going to. Uh, so you want to start as simplistic as possible, as hand-holding as possible in that first phase of manual labeling, and then you go back and modify your labels to look for recommended labeling. Don't just jump straight into automatic because what you're doing on the back end of that is running service side automatic labeling policies in simulation mode and you're already identifying what would have gotten labeled and then you're working with the people that that actually impacts. You don't want to turn on automatic labeling for everyone right away. It's going to create problems. It's going to create false positives. You haven't had time to retrain the system. Uh, so follow that crawl, walk, run approach as much as possible. Um, you also want to leverage something like Content Explorer to identify data. Right within your organization, see where that lives, see if there's a, a heavy site that contains 75% of your credit card numbers. I've seen that happen. I've actually seen a SharePoint site that was 90% of the credit card numbers within the organization, and they had over a million credit card numbers in there. It was one site dedicated to that, and that tackled 90% of our needs for protecting credit cards. Right, So um, keep things like those tools that can help you identify data in mind before you start rolling out your labels, especially before you start implementing them automatically on your end users. Um, there is one important note on the service side labeling. It does have a limitation of applying 25,000 labels a day. So it'll continue scanning, but in a rolling 24 hours, only 25,000 labels would be applied. Um, this is complemented by the fact that not every single file gets labeled. And <clears throat> you are cleaning up data as you go, as well as users are also opening data and client side doesn't have that limitation. So um, <clears throat> with that, I am going to go ahead and get into a quick demo here. Um, so I'm going to take down the screen sharing and get the right window pulled up. Just going to show you some use cases of using the sensitivity labels within your office applications. Um, so before I do that, if you have any questions, now would be a great time for that. And we'll go ahead and go from there. All right, so to start off with, 
it's important to understand of like seeing your sensitivity labels, right? And, and knowing where they are, how to select them, things like that within your office applications. So it's under under your your taskbar up here at the top, the ribbon, there is a sensitivity icon. From there, you can select a drop down, and this is where you're going to see all of the labels that have been deployed to you. What I want everyone to focus on for right now is to ignore the edit rights and authentication users. I've got a couple of uh, test scenarios going on that I'm helping people with, so uh, don't mind those. We're going to look at public, general, confidential, and highly confidential. Um, the first thing I want to point out is public shows the shield. There's no sub labels. Public is its own label. There's no sub labels available to it. Um, but then you can hover over general and see my two sub labels there. So you have anyone unrestricted and then you have all employees unrestricted. I put unrestricted to say it's not encrypting the content. It's just applying a classification. When you do hover over it, it's going to give you the policy tip, the description for the users that you can figure within the portal. Uh, so it's going to say, you know, business data. If my mouse would hold still. Let me get back over it. Maybe. OK, it's not going to not going to show up now. Great, uh, but it shows you the user description that you enter whenever you configure the sensitivity label. So you can go through here and select the labels within the file manually. Again, there can be recommendations. There can be automation built into applying a label, but the user, if they have the edit rights permission on the file, which if I'm the original owner of the file, I do. Um, I can always come in here and change the label at the beginning. So an example of that is right now I have general all employees selected. That's actually my default label that I have set from the policy. So as soon as I open a document for the first time or create a new document or a new email, that is the label that is going to get applied originally. Uh, so it's going to start with the all employees. The reason I do that and the reason I recommend that for clients is typically a new document is considered working content. That working content is made for internal access. You don't want it to be leaving the company when it's half finished, right? You don't send out marketing announcements that you haven't finished your thought on or you haven't finished the branding or the design. You leave it internal until it's ready for that, that public use, until it's in its mostly finalized state, right? So general is general all employees is my default. This is an internal document only, and I'm going to show you how it stays internal with DLP here shortly. Um, so that's how you select your sensitivity labels if you want to do it from a manual process. There's also the option under the drop down menu here. You can see the sensitivity icon there. And this actually gives you the really big user description that I was just talking about. Um, the only other place, and I don't even know if anyone can even see it, I barely can, is down here on the very bottom of the word application. It shows the classification that's applied. Um, I wish there was a better way to highlight that for you, but. If you look down here close to the new comment right under there is, is a place to see the classification. So with that, that's how you see the labels. You can see the one that's been applied. Um, but if you want to downgrade the label, right? We talked about requiring a justification. Right now it's defaulted to the all employees general label. But if I want to say, well, this is public data, it, you know, it doesn't need that and that protection on or that classification. If I select public, it's now going to ask me to provide a reason for doing so because I am downgrading the classification of this content. So there's a couple of pre-built options. There's the previous label no longer applies. Previous label was incorrect, or you can select other. And you know, obviously, we want to train people to say, well, you know, xxx dash xx dash xxxx was not a social security number. It was a serial number. Uh, we don't want them entering that into the explanation here because it's actually sent it. It's actually sent unencrypted into the compliance portal where users should be able to see that information, uh, not general users, administrators, sorry. Uh, so you can enter a custom explanation here. And if you do select other, you have to type a reason into the box. You can't just say other and press enter. You have to provide a reason. So public data, and that's all I have to put, and I can hit change. And now I can see that the public label has been applied and it's automatically resaving the file because I've, I've changed the metadata of the content. Um, <clears throat> however, if I go and start entering, say, a credit card number, and I'm going to rely on this to work in a timely manner. This is not my actual credit card, so please, you know, you can try to use this if you want, but it's not a real credit card number. Right, I've entered one credit card number and it's CVV. All right, perfect. 
So I answered that credit card number and the system scanned the file as I'm working in real time. And as you can see, I've been given a policy tip here saying, hey, looks like you might have some sensitive data in here. We recommend that you apply this the sensitivity label of confidential anyone unrestricted. That's what my policy has been set to say. When I configured the confidential label, I said, look for any file containing a credit card number. It's actually one through nine credit card numbers. If it has one through nine credit card numbers, apply, recommend that the user applies this content. Um, <clears throat> so if I had entered 10 or more, it actually would have automatically applied the confidential all employees sensitivity label uh, for you or for me. So I can hit apply sensitivity label or I can hit show sensitive content and it's going to give me some context as to why it thinks I need that sensitivity label. As you can see, it's it's calling out the credit card number here. This is really apparent because that's all that this there's in this file. But if this was a massive, you know, 10 page file and they had just now entered the credit card number, well, that have been a little bit more handy in terms of being able to find that in a faster manner. Um, but I can hit apply sensitivity. And now it has applied the confidential anyone label, right? And I can go back and confirm that by clicking here confidential and I can see that it's selected. Um, but again, if I'm like, well, no, you're wrong, I'm going to downgrade this to general anyone unrestricted. Well, it's not going to ask me because it didn't save, but it should have asked me why I was downgrading it again. Uh, don't hold that against me. I'm moving too fast for the file and that is possible. Users can move too fast, but me downgrading that label just got logged in my activity explorer system. Um, so that's you know, that's a demo. That's an example of leveraging the sensitivity labels within your Office applications. Word is the easiest one to showcase this. Um, you're also going to see it in email here in a little bit uh, whenever we look at DLP. And I am trying to move fast, Kevin. I know we want to get to QA. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and head back to the presentation really quick. I'm just going to share my main screen from here because switching back and forth is tedious. All right, from current slide. <clears throat> All right, so looking at Microsoft's DLP, DLP is a security solution that is designed to prevent the unauthorized sharing, the unauthorized movement, unauthorized access of your sensitive information within your company. It is preventing that data from being lost or exfilled outside of your organization. Uh, there are many different locations. You've got, of course, your, your Exchange, your SharePoint, your OneDrive. Those are all your E3 capabilities, but if you look at your E5 capabilities, you've got Teams chat and channel messages, you've got devices, your third party apps, such through Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. Again, I talked about it being the SaaS platform. Uh, you've got on premise file repositories, and you can apply DLP to uh, Power BI content as well. Um, each location does have its own set of conditions and actions available to it. So when you configure your DLP policy, you want to select as few locations as possible because if I select say Exchange, SharePoint, Teams and devices, I'm only going to get the conditions and actions that are available in every single one of those, which means I'm really kind of restricting myself in, ter myself in terms of what I could do with Exchange DLP. Right? There's a lot to Exchange DLP, a lot more than there is with SharePoint. I need those specific capabilities for Exchange, so I want to create a DLP policy scope specifically to Exchange specifically two devices. The only caveat that I put there is most commonly you're OK to combine SharePoint and OneDrive. There is a couple of differences between the two. They're very small um, and I'll, I'll you'll see these and see those in some diagrams in a little bit. Um, looking at your DLP policies. There's a there's a flow of, of what you're really configuring within these policies. You have the policy itself where you're setting the name, you're telling it what content you're looking for, whether it's a pre-built template again like HIPAA or like the US Patriot Act, or if you want to use custom. You're also setting the scope of users and groups within the DLP policy and defining what locations the policy is looking at. So again, that's the exchange, the devices, the SharePoint. Uh, and then those contain your rules and your rules are where you're setting your conditions and actions. Um, it is again crucial to have your rules and the right priority. The highest priority, most restrictive policy will always be applied when multiple rules are matched. So you want to be careful in terms of how you organize your policies to make sure that you're not being over restrictive. Or allowing 
things to go through that shouldn't be, right? So just be careful with that. Um, but then you get into your conditions and actions, and that's really where you're configuring what you care about from a, a policy perspective. That's where you're saying, I'm looking for any file containing a social security number and a credit card number, or I'm looking for specific file types like a .exe, a .docx, which is a Word document, any PowerPoints, any notepad files, things like that, or a file containing one of those sensitivity labels. So again, we talked about how the system integrates with the sensitive info types and sensitivity labels expanding out within purview. Uh, you can use sensitivity labels as a condition on your DLP policy. So I'll actually show you that here in a little bit on DLP. I can block an email from being sent out if it has a, a an internal only sensitivity label applied to it or stop a file from being put on a USB based on its sensitivity label and nothing else. Um, the conditions do leverage any all. So again, you can say I'm looking for a credit card or a social security number or this amount of those two. You don't have to say I'm looking for credit cards and social security numbers, but you can. Um, and that would probably be more uh, more of a more restrictive rule because it has multiple types of sensitive data within it. And then you also have and or statements to build in ex specific exclusions or exceptions to your conditions as well when you're writing them. Um, and then you have your actions. So actions can be enforced based on the conditions of the file. Uh, so again, each location has its own potential actions that you can configure. I can't block moving to a USB through SharePoint, but I can through device-based DLP, endpoint DLP. Right, you. Those are some common examples there. Blocking USBs, blocking printing, blocking sending emails to external recipients based on content. Right, those are some common examples of your actions that are available to you. Um, and anybody that wants to read more on these, there's some diagrams here that shows you every condition and action available within each location. Uh, and I'm also doing a blog series on all of the different DLP locations right now on my website that you'll be able to access as well. Um, there's user notifications that you can configure for each rule. So it could be something like a policy tip. Um, so the similar to that yellow bar that you saw in my Word document with the label, you can apply a, a policy tip that's just gonna say, hey, look, this looks like it contains a credit card number. You're not gonna be able to send this externally or you need to override this block and then you can send it externally, which gets into the user overrides where you can give the users the capability of overriding the block with a valid business reason if you want to do so. So when you talk about the different rules, maybe rule one is one to 10 credit card numbers, but rule two is 11 or more. And in rule one, you can do the override, but in rule two, because there's so many, you can't override that block. Um, and then you have your incidents reports where you can notify multiple different people about what was shared, who did the sharing, and of course the administrative alerts that get triggered on every policy violation. That's a duplicate slide. All right. <clears throat> These are the diagrams I talked about. So you have your cloud DLP. I did combine the SharePoint and OneDrive here, but you can see under document is shared. That is an ex uh, OneDrive for business capability exclusively, not for SharePoint. Um, and that's just saying it's shared you know, through anyone with the link or it's shared for anyone outside of the owner of the OneDrive site, um, which obviously that's a little different than SharePoint. So. Um, here's some diagrams for all of these. Again, you're going to have this. I want you all to be able to reference these. Um, it is a little difficult to find all of these in a single location. Uh, so hopefully these diagrams can help you reference this quickly uh, moving forward. Endpoints, Teams chat and channel messages, and then Exchange DLP as well. Um, don't have any for some of the more complex ones like on-premise file repositories. Um, those take a little more time to demo and put together. So not something that I can easily do in this one hour call. So, um, you know, with that, I think at this point, go ahead and get into the live demo. I kind of covered all my recommendations when we were talking previously. Um, so go ahead and demo some DLP policies here for you and, and, and show you that. Uh, and we'll go from there. Again, any questions, please, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, so the first thing I want to start with from a DLP perspective is actually going to be an exchange message. Um, so <clears throat> I have got an email here configured to go to an external DLP testing Gmail account that I configured. Um, so as you can see, it's cloudy DLP testing at gmail.com, which is obviously outside of my organization. 
and I have the general all employee sensitivity label applied. So within my policy, I've said that general all employees is internal only and can't be sent to external recipients. There's no overriding that. If you have that label applied, that is meant for internal use only. So you can't override that. And all you can see up here at the top is a policy tip saying large counts of sensitive info, please handle appropriately. I'm not creative with my policy tips. I usually let the more creative people for my clients configure those because they already have them figured out. Um, <clears throat> it'll actually tell you that the following recipients are the reason you can't send this message. Uh, and you can have them removed by clicking the X or you can go through the two line and remove them yourself. Uh, which would be a lot harder to do if you had a lot of recipients built into this. But if I hit send, it just tells me I can't. It tells me the reason for not being able to send it and I have to hit OK. There's there's nothing I can do until I remove that recipient, uh, which is an external user. So once I do that, it's no longer going to block me from hitting send, although there's no one in the two line, so I can't hit send, right? Um, but if I were to change that to say public, sorry, let's not do public, let's do uh, confidential, anyone unrestricted. This is approved for external access. So if I go and take a look at that, it should be scanning it. Once I enter the external recipient again, it's going to scan the content, start looking for the conditions that I've configured within the policy. There it goes. Now it's giving me the policy tip. But the difference this time is I can hit override. Because this label is approved for external uh, use, I can override this block and say this recipient is entitled to receive this content. I did configure an option that says I must specifically acknowledge this override uh, within Exchange. I hit that, I press override. Now I can send this message. I've overridden that block and I can send that message. Um, so that is Exchange DLP. But if we go and look at Endpoint DLP, and I'll go ahead and throw this over. I've got a couple of files here within um, my OneDrive account, and I've also got a USB drive, right? And that USB drive is here, and this goes here, right? So now I've got a couple of files that are on my device. If I wanted to, for whatever reason, try and move those to a USB drive, I wouldn't. Hey, Mike, you're not able to see your screen. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I should have been sharing, but I'll take that down and redo it. Could be seeing it now, yes? Perfect. All right, they, and yes, Michael, sorry about that. Uh, I thought it was sharing. I don't know why it stopped. All right, so I've got a few different files here, and they are matching different rules from my endpoint DLP perspective. Um, high count means that there's a lot of sensitive data within that um, file, right? So if I go ahead and try to throw that over here, I am showing you the wrong screen um i got a block actually and let me i'm sorry everyone let me share the right screen here sorry you didn't get to see the notification that popped up whenever i did that and that's like the most important part so again i've got my high count file i try to throw that on a usb drive which my dlp policy says that's a no-no I now get my blocked activity notification that shows up in the bottom right hand side of my screen. Um, whereas if I do that with a lower count file uh, and these have credit card numbers inside of them, this one has like three, the other one has 13 in it. So again, it violates my high policy. Um, all right. Do the unrestricted label. Problem with live demos is they are prone to user error, which you are currently seeing unrestricted label. I can now enter a business justification for why I want to do that, uh, why I need that unrestricted label document from going to go onto that USB drive. So there's a couple of different options here. Uh, this is part of an established business workflow, manager approved this action, urgent access required. What I want to say is that these are all pre-built and can be modified within the purview portal. And the reason I say that is I really dislike the urgent access required. I'll notify my manager separately option here. Uh, I just don't believe that they actually are going to notify the manager and we've got files out there that shouldn't be out there after the fact. Uh, if you do other, you have to enter a, a valid reason for doing so, similar to the sensitivity labels, but I'll say part of an established business workflow. What's important to see here whenever I say that 
is it doesn't actually move the file. I have to repeat the action again. So if I do the restricted unrestricted label here, now it puts it on the USB drive because I've given it the reason to overwrite. Uh, similar to that, we can also control things like cloud uploads within Point DLP. So that was one of the options on the capabilities there. So if I take that, uh, let's say high count document again, and I want to put that in my personal email, I've realized that Exchange is going to stop me from sending it outside of the company. I've realized that I can't put it on a USB drive. I can't share it through SharePoint and OneDrive, which I'll show that in a minute too. Now I wanted to go ahead and just try to put it into my personal email so I can send it. Well, <clears throat> I've got Gmail being blocked, and now if I do that, it actually tells me that this is a blocked activity that cannot be completed. Uh, I can't give an override, but if I did try the unrestricted label, then I can provide the override. Similar to putting it on a USB drive, there's something like printing. You know, there's a lot of options for endpoint DLP. This is a huge ask for a lot of clients is getting endpoint DLP deployed because you know, if it's in the cloud, it's really easy to control, but if a user puts it on their device, it gets a little harder. Well, now you have endpoint DLP to stop that capability. Um, <clears throat> so with that, that is kind of the demo there of, of endpoint DLP. Um, what I do want to show is if I try to share this through OneDrive, right? If I go through here and I hit share, if I then enter, make sure this is set to people you choose and apply, and I enter Audi DLP testing at gmail.com. Now I get the block saying that I can't do that. So if I want to hit the view policy tip, <clears throat> it's going to give me the reason as to why I can't hit that. But if this was then the unrestricted label, which I'll do that now, it would actually give me the option to override that capability. So again, this is blocking pure block. You cannot override this capability, um, this, this rule here. But if you go back and do that with the unrestricted label and I share that again, I'll have the option to override that block and still send that through OneDrive uh, sharing to my Cloudy DLP testing account, which is outside of the organization. So now I still get told that I have to view the policy tip before I can hit send, but if I go into that policy tip, I can hit override here, answer my, my business reason, Valid vendor, submit, and I have to go back. It would press the button. There's it. Why? All right. Well, it didn't allow me to do that. I hit the override. Sorry, I tested this before the call, and I know it works. So, submit. I'll see where I can go back. OK, uh, well, I apologize, but that should be letting me override the block there, um, which it did let me override it, but it's not ungraying the send box. So I apologize for that. Uh, but that is the demo, and I am very sorry that that was having an issue there. Um, I'll take the user error on that again. Um, but with that, that is, you know, that is the presentation and the live demo. The last slide was the integration within the Microsoft ecosystem. Whole lot of words and information here. This is something again I want you all to have after the fact uh, where you can kind of go over some examples of how DLP sensitivity labels, the entire purview suite can integrate together to give you a holistic data security program. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and open up to questions, uh, Q&A, and then see if anybody has anything. There was a couple of questions that did come in. Um, Michael um, had asked, and specifically around um, the DLP, uh, uh, automation of a notification to a user's ad, uh, ad manager and or uh, say global admin. So when you tried to pull that file over, for example, if I'm correct, Michael, uh, or man correct, please feel free to come off mic or come off mute. Um, will a notification be sent when someone attempts to um, 
move a file that's a, a violation of policy? Yeah, so whenever you configure your, your rules within your DLP policies, you configure the notifications that are triggered, right? So if they move a file that is matching your DLP policy, you can configure not only like by default, it's going to go to global administrators, but you can set a maybe a shared group called cybersecurity at companydomain.com. And that entire uh, shared mailbox is going to receive the alert and you'll be able to go into the portal and investigate it. One of the things um, that is important to note is when you do the investigation, you're going to be able to see the full context of the file and what had triggered the policy there. So be very careful with who you give investigative rights to because they could be viewing a valid social security number, credit card number, things like that. Uh, Paul uh, had asked um, subscription level for endpoint DLP. I actually think I know this one. Um, that's Microsoft 365 E3. Um, uh, it's E5. E5, deal. okay. Yes. Um, Defender for Endpoint, um, does that also include that as well? Because that's technically... It does not. Okay, good. I'm glad that you were able to ask. So a good thing to know about this is um, what Mike and I are talking about, the difference between core licensing and add-on licensing. Um, and the, the charts that he did, I cannot explain how amazing those are because that's hours and hours of technical documentation to go through because it does not get presented that way ever. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's e it's it's Microsoft E5 licensing um, for full endpoint DLP. Um, Lowell, uh, just more of a comment. Um, it's really helpful. Uh, thank you. I'm willing to do a session on configuring data retention policies sometime. They'd definitely be interested. So I don't know if Mike, if you wanted to toss back into chat. Um, your information, his booking link is also pinned uh, as well into the chat. Um, one question that I actually had somebody write into me in advance of this was about false positives. Um, they more so just if you could speak just very briefly, like just maybe where you've seen these occur more often and or yeah. just some bootstrapping like strategies for um, how you typically unpack those kind of things because apparently they they had been dealing with this problem for going on a month um, just with constant false um, false flags uh, coming up. So the first thing that it starts with is making sure that whenever they receive the alert and it is a false positive is actually classifying the alert properly. That's going to help retrain the system. It's going to go back and tell everything, hey, you were wrong. This wasn't that situation. Um, another option there is something like the automated uh, simulation mode for labels. You go out and look for content, you can actually go and mark that as true or false positives, and that helps retrain the system on what is or is not a social security number, a credit card number, a custom sensitive info type. The truth is, is it's it's all machine learning and, and training itself on your data and saying what confidence level it has that this is a credit card number, that this is a social security number. So Another thing to do within their policies is make sure that they're not looking for low confidence on everything. So if you say low confidence on a social security number, it could flag anything that's nine digits as being a, a social security number, but that's not. It, it, there is a specific set of criteria that should be matched to be a social security number. But if you do low confidence, it's dropping down the overall percentage to being down in the 60s on the system. So, it, I mean, that's if we go back to school rules, that's a D. And I, I was never. My dad was never happy if I brought home a D on the on the report card, right? So raise the confidence level that you're looking for there, but also use the tools available to you like Content Explorer, rule classification, simulation mode for poly, for labels to go out and look for that data within your organization and, and take the time to actually train it and say it is a false positive, it is a true positive. Don't just mark false positives. Mark true positives as well, because that's going to re-ensure the confidence of the system. Um, one thing I want to go back to, Michael, I'm I'm sorry, I didn't see the part about automating a notification to the user's manager. Um, there are capabilities within inside of Exchange as conditions and actions where you can trigger that. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little limited in saying I, I'm pretty sure you can only do that with Exchange DLP. Um, the notification in terms of notifying the manager. Again, you can't say based on this user, send it to this person. You can say based on this rule, send it to these people, but it wouldn't be for an approval. The only place it goes to a manager for approval is through Exchange. 
uh, through Exchange DLP. So a little limited there. I'm hoping more comes out, especially from the Power Automate and you know the Power Apps perspective. Um, but right now, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, to my knowledge, if I'm wrong on that, I'd be happy to be uh, told so. Um, Lowell, in terms of doing retention, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Again, the bookings link is linked there. You can put time on my calendar, send me an email. Um, or if it's something where I come back here with, with TechSoup and, and do another conversation of, all about data retention, I'm happy to do that as well. I'm actually um, at my current role with Navy Federal, I'm actually doing a massive data retention project and um, there's a lot of undertaking there. So happy to have that conversation as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, if you brought full up power transparency, I am not yeah. a power user. Um, I want to get better in that space, but if yeah. it is possible through Power Automate, I cannot begin to tell you how to do it. Yeah. Um, we actually have somebody on staff that's uh, Power Automate certified. Um, shoot me uh, an email, Michael. I just pinged my personal alias into the chat. Um, and I can certainly I work with um, this gentleman on um, on a couple of other power apps that we're building actually right now. So um, with that, we're uh, we're getting uh, we've actually hit past time. Uh, uh, thank you so very much, Mike. This is high level stuff, um, but these are the conversations that I love to have because this is really getting into the nitty gritty of um, what Microsoft 365 really uh, the capabilities that it has. Um, so just some resources um, about getting started, um, digital skills, uh, training courses, uh, digital transformation forum. Uh, next month, we're going to switch um, the hit the switch a little bit. Um, we're moving um, off of Microsoft and uh, over to grant writing. Uh, so if you are able to join us, if you've got somebody on your development team or grant writing team that's interested, this is going to be an awesome session. Uh, we're actually going to be focusing on, as the title implies, grant writing with a purpose, uh, strategies specifically um, around uh, gaining access uh, to grant funding for things um, such as technical assistance, uh, maybe something like that Mike does. Um, we understand that organizations, um, you know, are still struggling to try and, and make um, their digital acquisitions uh, happen. And my hope is, is that this session next month will uh, shed some light on how to, to, to access that funding. Some additional resources. Again, this is all going to be in the slide deck that's uh, passed out to those who have attended next week. Could the digital assessment tool, um, a great way to spend some time um, learning a little bit more about your, uh, what your organization is doing. Um, where areas where it, it maybe could benefit from adding new technologies, et cetera, um, along with our blogs. Um, they're just these are all just great resources uh, to have. So with that, I'm going to close it out. Mike, I love live demos. Awesome job. These are yeah. seeing this in real time. I don't know how anybody else really felt about that, but to me to actually see what this looks like, I think is the difference because when you go from again from technical documentation and some screenshots, to what this really looks like, I, I really I feel like that that's a, that's a game changer. Uh, so with that, uh, we are going to have the content uh, to you all next week. Um, that includes the slide decks along with a link uh, to today's recording. So with that, we wish everybody uh, an adieu and have a great day. All right, thanks everyone. Sorry for the blunders on the live demo, but thank you all for having me. And then um, always feel free to reach out. Thanks, guys.